Good morning again. Uh, my name is uh, Chandra. Uh, I'm the partner solution architect at AWS. I'm your room host today. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, hope you're enjoying your summit on day two. Uh, some housekeeping items. We have an exit door at the front and at the back. Restrooms are out to your right when you exit out of the door. So uh, I, we thrive on feedback at it, Amazon. So please take a moment to fill out the survey once the session is done. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand it over to Sanjay Padi. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, AI and uh, machine learning research. Thank you. So thank you so much for joining. Um, so I'll talk about a uh, couple of things related to AI and machine learning. Uh, I'm, I'm really uh, thankful to Cornelia and, and Lise to join us. Uh, they will talk about how they apply uh, machine learning or AI in, for example, using a topic modeling for detection of hurricanes or detection of something uh, where you can take timely action if you know how to train it early enough, right? So some of the studies will talk about that. Just a brief recap, uh, if you talk to 10 people or 100 people in a given audience, what is AI, you'll get 100 different answers. So in general, we sometimes mix between machine learning and AI and sometimes deep learning. But these are three different uh, distinct subjects, right? So for the sake of discussion today, we'll talk about uh, artificial intelligence as a system or a service. That, uh, that can perform tasks that usually requires human, uh, human intelligence. Uh, there are a couple of articles and web pages, you can find it here. Where one can, one can, they have tutorials and how to, how to train your own models and how, how to do about that. It's really an old uh, system, right? AI was started in 1950s. There, there were biological degenerative models were there. So it's nothing very new. For a long time, it began for a long time. In 1950s, it started, but it, was not, it didn't go too far. Until, until in 1990s, when machine learning came, where it started becoming more useful. For example, all you have, now all of our spam filters <laughs> happens by machine learning. In those days, imagine if you are searching for a cup. I'm just making up here, right? Imagine you search for a cup in your search engine. You will not like the cup, the cup you like is in page 42. You will, not, you will not like it, right? So, which means one need to order it based on your preference. And, and preference can be only obtained based on what you clicked or what you looked at it. And that became very interesting. And that's, Amazon started working on that uh, on, on its own way, but that started taking traction in 1990s. They were also trying to, for example, Netflix was trying to predict which movies you will like, for example, right? And they were trying to give a million dollars award for even if you can predict, let's say, 10% uh, of, 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 of for a given recommendation system. So it slowly started traction in 1980s till deep learning started coming up. And one of the most important of deep learning was because of GPUs or accelerated processing. Just, just an example, a CPU will have tens of cores, right? Tens to hundreds. But a GPU will have roughly have thousands of cores built inside. So people started using deep learning, and then convolution neural net came, which can distinguish features. And that became extremely vital. So in this particular study, we Generally, AI and machine learning is classified typically in, in kind of three categories. There are always a, a variation, a combination of that, right? So one is what we call supervised learning, and bulk of the work we do is based on supervised learning. Then, then there are something called unsupervised learning, you're, where you're defining a cluster, a method, or groups, and within a group, you find the in people of common interest. So, the, the third one is reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is reward-based system. Basically, if you learn something, you will take action, right? So that's reinforcement learning. 
And best, best bulk of the learning mechanism is really a combination of, of all the three. So we started collaborating, on, especially on research side, with, uh, with uh, many folks in the, in the universities, but also with National Science Foundation. Recently, for example, a year ago, we started working with NSF on some of the projects on, under the uh, umbrella of what we call big data, where NSF invested roughly about 20, 20, $25 million in a solicitation, where roughly, uh, you know, so, so many of the studies they started, uh, researchers who got the award are started doing it. I mean, look at it, detecting financial market manipulations. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that particular study. But also domain adaption. For example, if you can predict a hurricane in advance and even half an hour before, you can take some disaster management or you can talk to Red Cross to take some action, even if it's 30 minutes before you predicted. So some of the example Diana will give on that particular study. So today, so I'll touch base on what, the, uh, what we call disaster management. But there are many awards people did in research and they all are working on AWS on that. So the particular topic of the study is it's really interesting. It's called uh, da uh, Big Data for the, for the, uh, for the Market Manipulation. This was done by University of Michigan in collaboration with, with us and National Science Foundation. So what is this study is? So study is, is, is really to find a mechanism to detect or mitigate market manipulation. So what does that mean? Imagine the stock market, right? In a stock market, there are billions of transition happens per day. Imagine you start a company, let's call it a company A, and you say, I want to bid for $100 for the stock, but you have no interest in buying or selling that. But you are really doing a massive amount of request to buy or sell that particular thing. And given many things are interconnected, the prices will decrease. And that's a process called spoofing, and it's illegal. How do stock exchange or in the country FINRA will monitor whether you're doing it? Maybe you're really selling it and it just changed your mind, right? So spoofing is a mechanism to ma manipulate the market such that uh, you can buy or, or you can sell it, right? And so machine learning is a fantastic application where you train it on a daily trading events such that you should be able to do that. So this, is, this particular study was got funded, so I'll talk a little bit about this particular study. So spoofing, as I mentioned, is a, it's a crime. One should not be doing it, but we also need mechanism to detect them, and this is the study is to do that. So how do we happen in practice? This is of, it's really a practice of submitting large spurious order to buy or sell some security to mislead the other traders. So in this particular example, you see, uh, I wanted to show is that this is the true value order, but somebody is putting a lower value and thus try to lower the price or increase the price. So uh, this, this is, as I said, done in collaboration with uh, University of Michigan and Georgia Tech, AWS, as well as NSF and all that. So how do we manipulate this? Is, is you try to what we call model what is happening in a daily trading. Huh? So in this particular case, we took the market data and it was given by the financial regulation uh, in, uh, agencies to us to study it. Uh, we modeled the background trading and then try to use machine learning to actually inject those behavior just so that you can, and again, it's a live trading of 70 billion uh, happening per day, right? And then inject and then try to find your own, own way. And there is a process to do that uh, that is called agent-based simulations where you, uh, you, you, you do a given transaction at a given function of time where either you model it as the background only behavior or you start injecting different behavior, right? And that particular process is, uh, uh, is begins with simulating the market, uh, market uh, financial market as as, as a multi-agent system. It, it uh, uh, starts with evaluating the performance on by the impact of spoofing. So that means you uh, you first see how the spoofers do it, and then try to inject that in your background only daily trading mechanism. 
And there's a beautiful thing, uh, mechanism to do that, and it's called, it comes under the uh, d uh, classification of unsupervised learning. Do you know unsupervised learning? Okay, let me give you a very simple example. Please do, don't generalize it. Let us imagine we want, how do we learn about uh, which movies to watch when we were very young and beautiful in our school? You go to your class and you ask your good friend, which movie shall I watch? And the, your good friend said, movie A. And there is not so good friend, you know, he's, you never talk with him, he's, he's not good in class at, at all. He said, movie B. Which one will you watch? Movie A. So what you're doing is you're clusterizing people of same interest. Even if you no, never search for movie A, I can predict it. So you have to find interest of same kind to clusterize it. That's one of the mechanism of what we call so unsupervised learning. So I'm not defining any boundary conditions. I'm just trying to de uh, define a given pattern. So one of the way of doing that is via also by a generative model, or we call JANS. So what is JANS? Is? So it's called generative adversarial network. So you start with a given function, create a generator, and you, you, can, uh, you can train it on real images, but also inject what we call fake images such that you can do a differentiation that how much of the was fake is. And if you can find it, since you're injecting it, you know, you can do a back prop propagation, calculate a loss function, and see how, how well you did. So it's, it's really an interleaved training of two different neural net. One, use noise as a vector uh, to generate what we call fake sample. And they discriminate, which basically tells you based on what they learn, whether it's a fake or not. So we started working with this and, and try to model a given class of order, what we call uh, ordering a book evolution. So you start with the time series information, how the real life happens, and the generator outputs, uh, and, and uh, we, we, we started tracking the state of the history. And this is the network which, which looks like. It's, uh, it has a given function, uh, uh, which has what we call LSTM layer, long short term memory layer, so that you can start doing the, the at a time series data, and these are the given function at a set of uh, time, while also injecting, uh, injecting noise. So we started using, uh, in, in this particular case, we started using uh, with a notebook, Jupyter notebook. How many people know about notebook? Okay, so I don't have to say anything about notebook. So we, we start with the pre-trained notebook. Uh, we started using a SageMaker. So as you can imagine, SageMaker supports both machine learning models, like the example I gave, clustering. So you can do k-min clustering. Uh, but also it, it supports deep learning models like MXNet or TensorFlow or things of that kind. But it also uh, uh, provides you mechanism to bring your own algorithm. So SageMaker is really a fantastic flame, framework where you start with your input data uh, at, at, a, at a given storage element, let's say Amazon S3, all you need to bring it is, is your given training code, access given module, and define your loss function and, and do the training such that the end output is a container, you can store it in a given way. But at, at the same time, it has built-in uh, built -in interface to CPUs and GPUs for your given training. So we started with SageMaker and implemented uh, the generative adversarial network code over there. And at the end, this, this is the results we get. So for example, in the real life, and this was like very quickly run, right? So this particular parameter was, so what are the parameters you want to look? Price, right? So we put a real price from the data from, uh, from, from the stock markets, and then we simulated it directly uh, using this. So you're, you're doing price, your quantity, interval unit, and various other quantities such that you can start building a given discriminant uh, in order to do that. So this study in process, but we are already you know, uh, targeting many of the things. This is this is one of the one of the studies we are doing. So coming back to to, to, to with Amazon. So I gave one example of unsupervised learning, right? But you can do anything. So you can start with supervised learning if you do not know how to train on. But there are areas for computer vision you can do using um, Amazon recognition, which is already having a pre-trained modules. You can also do uh, documents, speech, languages, and many other things. 
in many cases, you have, one needs data labeling and all. If you don't know tomato is a tomato, you, know, you cannot predict tomatoes, right? So there is a mechanism to do that called ground truth where, uh, where you can do data labeling and then, then use SHMaker to do it. But also, you can also work at the infrastructure level. Uh, as I said, these are the set of services you have. Uh, you, one can start building, train, and deploying model uh, uh, machine learning at scale. Uh, in, in everything, it's a basic common pattern. You start with a pre, pre-built notebook, uh, then, then you define a one-click one uh, training for, to define uh, a, a infrastructure, then you do the model optimization, then you deploy it. So I'll give you a couple of examples where it can be useful. I'll pick up a couple of them from diagnosis and outcome cases, uh, as well as in healthcare and life sciences. So here is one study we did. This was studied, done by Stanford University. Many people get diabetics, right? It affects the nerve vessels. So as I mentioned in, 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 in convolutional neural net, it has a beautiful property of detecting any deviation in there. So imagine you start training on uh, naked eyes, or back, call it background-only hypothesis, you have certain nerve vessels. So if diabetics affects your eyes, then th there'll be a change in these nerve vessels, right? And that one can do using convolutional neural net or deep learning uh, uh, for, to, to detect diabetics. So this is one of them to, for early detection of diabetics. You can also do skin cancer detection at a very early stage. Uh, you can also study, for, this is FDA-approved study for, for medical imaging. Uh, you can also detect uh, if you ha uh, if there is a uh, choke in the, in, the, in the lungs or in the heart in the vessels. So that, that also you can do with, with machine learning here or deep learning here. This is one of the studies we tried to do is using Amazon recognition uh, as well as natural language processing. I didn't talk a little about that, uh, that but you can automatically get the checks X-ray. NLP will tell you that this is a HEPA or uh, PHI information, so 19 parameters, so you can detect, automatically remove it, and then start using this as a training module to auto-detect if somebody has a, has a cancer or not. This particular study is open, and I, it's available. You can copy-paste, and you can do it yourself as well. I thought there was a link, but uh, I can send you the link. So, so this way, for example, you can detect if there is any deviation in the chest X-ray uh, in this particular study. It's, it's publicly available in, 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 in our sites. So you should be able to find it. So people also started uh, using, so this is for medical field, but also people recently worked with uh, Nevada's to detect, uh, for example, uh, big data uh, to track wildfires for the quality. So it can be also used for, for humanitarian uses, and this is the, they're trying to do at, at Nevada. Um, you can, uh, one example I picked up from my next speaker slide is, can we train it on previous hurricanes using the, using the data from other, uh, Twitter and other, other medias and start predicting it for the future or maybe one so that you can employ, let's say, while hurricanes are here, let's say, you can start employing uh, relief agencies like Red Cross. So this particular study was done using you know, past hurricanes. And here what you show, see is this is the predicted path of Hurricane Arma. And this is the real path of Hurricane Arma, right? So with that, it's really a very exciting field. Many people, it's not very difficult to get started. We, we have built-in modules. But with that, I introduce my next speaker, and she's going to go details into how you can also use machine learning or deep learning to start predicting hurricanes. Thank you. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Um, I am an um, associate professor at University of Illinois at Chicago, um, and I'm very excited to talk about uh, a project uh, that I lead um, on deep learning for disaster management and response. Um, this is, uh, so I'll start with acknowledgments. So this project is made possible um, 
through support from um, NSF, through uh, several um, NSF grants, and AWS. And so I started working on, um, on disaster management, on, uh, the, on, on this disaster-related project um, after one of my uh, personal experiences. Uh, so I used to live in Texas, and during the spring, uh, the spring season, there are a lot, a lot, lot of storms, a lot of tornadoes. And there was one year, uh, one spring, um, when there was a, a, a tornado and there were lots of al alerts. I wasn't really paying attention, um, so I thought there would be nothing. And I was careless at the time. So I went home, which was not safe, uh, instead of staying in the department and uh, uh, take shelter. So it was one of the, the most terrifying experiences that I had, uh, that the tornado just passed by through, through the, uh, 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 above my house, and it was, it was terrible. So I thought um, I would um, work on disaster management, try to uh, help people, educate people, as well as uh, help disaster management focus their um, limited efforts in the, in the areas that uh, need most help. So in doing so, uh, we use social media um, and social networking sites uh, such as Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram. Uh, so these social networking sites connect us to the world and they have become part of our daily lives. Um, so as um, the use of social media is on the rise, so is the use of social media during disaster events. And as the, the deadly disasters happen uh, almost every week, communities that are affected by these disasters have become the source of uh, big disaster data. For example, during the uh, Hurricane Sandy, there were, uh, which happened in 2012, there were more than 20 million tweets that were posted during the disaster. And um, this uh, shows the, the distribution, the number of tweets per day, with the largest number of tweets posted um, in the days when uh, the, the uh, hurricane hit the East Coast. Um, similarly, for uh, Tohoku earthquake that happened in Japan, there were about 5,000 tweets that were uh, posted every, uh, every uh, second, and there were about 1.5 million tweets that were tweeted, posted um, in, in about five minutes. Um, in the, in the time that the hurricane happened, the, the, the earthquake happened. And this is, this shows, this plot, oops, sorry. Um, this plot here shows the communication that happened, uh, communication from uh, Twitter uh, that happened during the earthquake. Um, so, um, social media, used in the, in the context of disaster events is very useful, has very high value. And so researchers ass assess that, uh, assert that uh, bystanders on the ground are uniquely positioned to share information that may not yet be available elsewhere in the information uh, space. For example, uh, seeing this, uh, image that is uploaded in Twitter, we can easily understand what is the situation on the ground um, and try to avoid the affected areas. So scholars of disasters see hope in social media and they argue that social media can produce 
more accurate results, even in advance of official um, sources, for example, CNN. Still, social media is not very used by disaster management, by disaster response organizations. And some of the reasons for this may be uh, because they operate uh, in conditions of, uh, of extreme uncertainty and because there is an exponential number of uh, social media posts, tweets, for example, and this increases also the uh, irrelevant information. So this irrelevant information diminishes people's ability to find information that they need in order to organize relief efforts uh, for uh, response organizations, to find help uh, for people on the ground, and um, potentially to save lives. So how can we identify useful content in Twitter? One approach that we can do could be based on key keyword-based search. For example, we can search for um, Oklahoma tornado or together or separate words, Oklahoma and tornado or hashtag Oklahoma tornado or we can do location-based uh, search, collecting all the tweets that are posted based on their geolocation. However, this retrieves not only relevant information, but a lot of tweets that are irrelevant. As in this case, um, there is a tweet here, uh, an example, I've lived in Oklahoma since I was born. So this has nothing to do with the Oklahoma tornado. On the other hand, so this uh, keyword-based approach could be useful, but again, brings a lot of irrelevant information. A manual selection, given the, the millions of tweets that are posted in disasters, is very time consuming and is not feasible and sustainable today. Hence, there is an increasing need for automated approaches for extracting appropriate information from uh, disaster Twitter, which could improve the uh, disaster response. So we proposed a framework that used information, sorry, <laughs> I'm, um, so that, that used information from disasters that happened before together with, disaster, with an on, data from an ongoing disaster in a type of a, a domain adaptation approach, trying to transfer knowledge, knowledge that we learn from previous disasters to the disaster that just happens currently. And particularly we do so because as a disaster happens and it ha happens very quickly, we don't have label data to train supervised machine learning classifiers. And so in that case, what can we do? How can we use previous disasters, pre label, label data from previous disasters to cope with the current disaster? So we, we propose this um, frame, the domain adaptation framework um, that used information from previous disasters to cope with um, with a uh, current disaster, with a, with a current disaster. And we use deep learning as well as uh, the tools that are available from AWS. For example, the Comprehend, uh, which I'll describe um, a little later. Um, so then um, this information that is uh, that is extracted using these deep learning approaches and tools from AWS is forwarded to the response organizations and help them better manage uh, the, the, their response. So in the, the workflow, 
So th there is data collection and analysis. We use Twitter API, the Twitter streaming API, to crawl the tweets. And then we use NLP, natural language processing tools, to uh, process the, the tweets, um, to extract the, the text from the tweets, to extract the hashtags, um, some, some of the user information, if uh, these are, um, for example, uh, official, uh, use, uh, official sources like CNN uh, or um, uh, individuals, people, people on the ground. And then we also extract the geolocation when, whenever this geolocation is available. And then perform text classification, um, NLP and text analytics on the tweets. So now, given the, the stream of tweets and the, the text that we extracted from the tweets, then we perform several classification tasks. For example, first train a classifier that will um, classify if the tweet is relevant to the disaster or not. Then if that particular tweet is posted by eyewitnesses, and if, if it's posted by eyewitnesses, uh, if it requires some urgency, uh, some, some actions to be taken uh, urgently, and then if the tweets are, are with, posted by eyewitnesses, um, then uh, if they are informative or not, and then if they are informative, if they convey some type of uh, situational awareness. So if they convey information about damages, damages or injured people or missing people, dead people, and so on. So there are uh, several classes, like uh, Sanjay mentioned, several classes of machine learning algorithms, uh, supervised, uh, supervised learning um, that requires large amounts of label data, um, domain adaptation, that uses, um, and this is, the, um, this is the, the approach that we proposed, um, to use information knowledge from um, prior, from uh, source disasters, to cope with a target disaster, and to transfer knowledge from source to target disasters. And then unsupervised, that will help us understand what kind of topics people are talking about in a disaster. So, um, as I mentioned, in our framework, we used um, AWS, the Amazon Comprehend, which is a, a, a natural language processing and text um, analytics tool. Um, and so, how does it work? Given the, the uh, stream of data, the tweets, the input, oops. Something is uh, not working. <laughs> so anyway, um, I, I can uh, continue talking. Um, so given the, the uh, stream of tweets, the comprehend will identify the type of keywords, the, the keywords or the hashtags from the tweets that will help us categorize tweets based on, for example, as I mentioned before, based on their situational awareness. Like um, if the tweet is about missing people or dead people, or if there, are, if there is, for example, power loss uh, in some area, or a bridge has, uh, was dam damaged and so on. So um, Comprehend will help extract entities, um, will, help, will help us extract uh, topics, topics of discussion, and uh, if the slides will be um, still available, um, I, can show, I, I will show you some of the topics that we extracted um, with Comprehend. Um, we also can track, we, we, we can also um, predict the location of tweets based on, the con based, based on their content 
And then we can track the path of, the, of a particular hurricane and how, how it progresses uh, geographically. And so using Comprehend, we were able, and as uh, also Sanjay mentioned, we were able to very, very nicely uh, predict um, the, the, um, the path of the hurricane, which overlap quite nicely with the actual path of the hurricane. Um, so, um, um, so again, using the AWS, we can extract entities, keywords, hash, recommend hashtags, um, predict the location. Um, we also, so in addition to using the um, Comprehend, the Amazon Comprehend tool, um, we also designed models that were uh, deep learning models that were trained on disaster data, and as I mentioned, on uh, data from previous disasters. Um, and um, uh, used these de deep learning models uh, to predict data from, uh, from a current ongoing disaster. Let's see if it's, if it's working. So I can show you some of the results that we obtained um, before I... Uh, Okay, all right, great. So, uh, and now this is not working. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so this is, um, okay, so, um, so these are the topics that uh, we extracted, uh, that we extracted using the uh, Amazon Comprehend, and so these are the words that cluster together in a topic, uh, hurricane degenerates into uh, tropical waves. So the words that are, uh, that cluster together are very, very informative about this topic. For example, hurricane, um, cyclone, wave, um, and so on. Um, and then, um, so these are the results that we obtained uh, using the deep learning uh, approaches that we designed um, for identifying informative tweets. Um, so we trained uh, deep learning, the convolutional neural networks and recurrent, recurrent neural networks, long short-term memory networks, um, to predict if a tweet is informative to, to a disaster response organization or not. And as we can see, using the, the CNN, the convolutional neural networks, the performance is quite high on both uh, natural disasters and uh, uh, natural disasters and non-natural disasters. And we compare this with traditional machine learning classifiers on features that were engineered, features that were extracted from the tweet content. And um, again, as we can see here, the deep learning approaches perform much better than uh, the, um, much better than the traditional machine learning. Um, and this is, um, this is the um, uh, hurricane, the Hurricane Harvey predicted path. Um, so as we can see here, there is quite a nice overlap between the predicted path with the actual path of the hurricane. And with this, um, I'm, I conclude the the talk, and um, I'll uh, head it over to um, Liz. Thank you. Hello, 
Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Lee St. Dennis from the University of Colorado's Earth Lab. And today I'm going to be talking about a project that I've been working on to mine social media data for emergency response. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about a collaboration I have we've had with um, the Amazon Web Services disaster response team that's helping us push this project forward in the next steps. Um, Sanjay, this is... Okay, all right. So uh, my background is in crisis informatics and my research focuses on integration of social media and emergency response. And as many of you are familiar, uh, the use of social, me or social media and advancements in communication technologies have fundamentally transformed how people communicate and share information in disaster. And it's created new opportunities for people to uh, participate in disaster response, but it's also created a whole new set of challenges. Um, and I've been motivated by one particular challenge, um, which is that at the height of impact in a disaster when it's most important to identify relevant information, it's often incredibly challenging to do so for both emergency responders and communities impacted by disaster. So uh, at the, in large scale events can often generate millions of tweets as people around the world react and respond to what's happening on the ground. So, oh, my, there's a slide missing, Sanjay. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background, uh, my research has been heavily participatory. So to understand this, uh, to understand the impacts of social media on emergency response, I, be, I immersed myself in uh, the virtual operational support team community, which is, uh, so I was part of uh, supporting emergency response on over 40 uh, emergency response activations. And so as part of that experience, I've spent hundreds of hours participating in social media monitoring with emergency responders and been part of the, communi uh, the communications between the teams on the ground and the virtual teams doing that support work. And I've also, as part of that, done uh, lots of analysis of the social media data collected around those events. In, 20, in 2014, while I was supporting uh, the team working on the Carlton Complex wildfire in eastern Washington state, um, on July 17th, adverse conditions and a wind event in the evening caused that fire to blow up by over 100,000 acres overnight. Um, and it burnt through the towns of Pateros and Brewster and destroyed over 353 homes. The picture on the left is what was left of one of the homes in one of those communities, which has become a familiar sight these days. Um, the, the fire progression map on the right, the dark blue and the, the neighboring teal in that progression map gives you a feel for the magnitude of the increase overnight of that fire. Um, and I, as part of that monitoring team, it was really hard. The days following that blow up, it was really hard to keep pace with the social media uh, conversation or the traffic on that fire. And after that fire, I met with the public information team to go, to go over my analysis of the data. And the lead PIO on that fire, a woman named Chris Erickson, made a comment that really resonated with me, which was, she said, you know, Lise, in the thick of it, what I really need to know is what I don't know. And I, as I sat and I thought about it, I realized that every event that I'd worked on that had rung true. So when I worked on the 2013 floods, there was a particular tweet that the, one of the public information officers pointed to and said, this is what keeps me up at night, that something like this will slip through the, tr through the cracks. And I thought about the study that we'd done on, the, on Hurricane Sandy when the uh, 911 was overloaded and the traffic overflowed onto Twitter and people improvised. And so following that conversation, I went back and I started thinking, how do we solve this problem? And so I started playing with this idea that you could use what, I could use what we knew and what I knew about social media communication and disaster to take what we knew to get at what we didn't know, essentially. 
So playing with this idea and the data that I was using for my analysis, I turned it around and I thought, how, do I, how can I safely take what I know off the top? And so the graph on the left is that idea applied to that, the day after the blow up of the fire. So um, the, the line at the top of the graph is the overall hourly volume on that day. And the line at the bottom of the graph is what was remaining after I took the knowns, the safe known values off the top. And it was, what's remarkable about that is that's one person's monitoring volume and I couldn't keep track of that in the day. So that I thought was really promising. Um, but really what was more exciting to me was that what was left once I took that off the top. What I found was the, the content that emerged you know, in contrast to media coverage, which tends to really focus on like the, the dramatic coverage and it's heavily dominated by the same sort of details. What you see when you strip out that, that common information is you start to see what's happening at the local level and you pick up all the, that individual, all those individual details that paint that fill in all the details and paint that detailed picture. And I saw a lot of value in that. So this is, having, having been through that, and I picked up, this is one person who I picked up a couple of their tweets and I realized how much more rich information was there. But the thing that really struck me is that it's a great idea, but it only works if you can do it in real time. And so I realized that it was a great candidate for machine learning. Um, and so the following summer, I trialed the idea on three more wildfires um, and I was able to simulate it in real time and then while I was finishing my dissertation. And then in 2016, I joined CU Earth Lab where I had access to the analytics hub and a team of machine learning experts and we be began working on this idea that we could build a neural net classifier. Um, but before I talk about that, and I also have been working with, uh, the other thing is we needed to collect the data in real time. And so the disaster response team has helped us with that piece. And so uh, they helped us, so we could focus on the classifier, they've helped us build our data collection process. Um, and so we're using AWS tools. It's cloud-based, so it can expand to whatever size we need if we have a huge data collection. We use Secret Ma Secrets Manager um, to trigger the ingestion process. It stores it in an S3 bucket. Um, and then we're using Glue and Athena to pull it out and manipulate it and prep it for classification. Um, and it's working great for us. We've been able to capture two seasons of catastrophic wildfires and hurricane data. Um, moving forward, they've help, helped us figure out a strategy for, we realize that as we start collaborating with response teams, we need to maintain independent collections and run multiple processes. Um, and also as an earth analytics lab, we want to start kicking off really large scale um, event or hazard specific data collection. So they've helped us figure out a strategy for doing that as well. Okay, um, so I'm gonna turn to our neural net. So we've been working on a neural net classifier for, for the Twitter data. Um, and our classifier looks at information about both the author and the tweet. And um, we've focused, we've spent a lot of our energy focused on the account at this point. And what we're really looking at narrowing down, narrowing in on is those accounts that are not part of official or media. Um, they aren't, they aren't, they don't come from, they're not representative of official or media sources, they're part of that big mass of the public community and they're generating personalized content. So to figure that out, we take in information, we take in the profile picture, we take in the profile, descriptive text from the profile, all the stats, um, and we look, at, we also calculate statistics from their recent um, tweet behavior and all of that. Uh, to do that, we use a number of different neural net models. So for the profile picture, we use a convolutional neural net. For all of the text, we use um, bidirectional LSTM, um, and then feed forward for all the statistics, and we combine them into one end-to-end -end model. And then intermediately, we combine 
um, and optimize those together. So each of those influenced the final predicted classification. Um, so, um, and we've actually even, we've had it, our classifier, even with a relatively small amount of data, this is the data from the, the three fires and a set of data from the camp, recent Camp and Woolsey fire. It's really good at predicting individual personalized content within that mass. Um, and the, res the tweets that we're getting, uh, the content is really good. Um, and since then, we've, there are certain categories that don't occur very often, and we've since gone in and, and remedied that with some supplemental data. Um, and so since then, we've started to turn our attention to the tweet level. And uh, my approach has always been to look at the classification from, from two approaches. So I look at both filtering out things that are safe to filter out and then prioritizing content that, that you can prioritize. I don't want to eliminate that middle ground because I've found that there's a lot of value in that. So at the height of impact, you may only have the bandwidth to look at those key life safety and ha specific hazards. But as that impact lessens, you really, don't, you really want to look at the broader localized content. Um, so looking at what you can filter out in any disaster, there's a huge volume of what I would categorize as just general response. So um, just general reaction, gratitude, thanks, and well wishes um, exemplified by the tweets on the left. And then this general synthesis of things like official updates and media coverage on the right, which I think are fairly easy to filter out. Um, and then the things that you want to prioritize um, it's a longer list than this. These are just general categories. It's based on my experience working with the teams and studies I've done on Hurricane Sandy, the Colorado floods, and then the fires that I've worked on. Um, and then the next step, so, so we're working on that data set. Um, I'm working on moving that into a space where I can start gathering feedback from some of the teams that I work on. And I'm also working on building an application, simple monitoring application that we would like to push forward and, and use on a real response of VOST activation so we can start gathering feedback so that we can start finding, validating my categories and incorporating more into the next round. And that's it. <laughs>